Hello and welcome to the Helios blog. My name is Helios here for another reaction video. Today, Matthew Hussey talks about men obsessing over women early on. Let's get into it. The reason she's alone is because she's difficult. Women are not accepting the bare minimum. Women fuck men they respect. All the women who say things like, I'm strong, independent, I don't need no man, like, y'all impress me. Women just gaslight each other and say what they want to hear. He said that I'll unintentionally sabotage myself because I'm nervous instead of just being calm and enjoying it. You have to s firstly see the nerves as a symptom. The nerves are a symptom of having put this situation, this person on a pedestal. That's right. And, and now I'm going to get incredibly nervous because I've told myself that it means something really significant if nothing comes of this. Right. You know, I've either lost someone amazing or... I've just come away from it thinking I'm not good because they didn't like me. And so what I, if, if this doesn't go well, then I'm going to go away feeling like I'm not worthy and I'm not good enough. And that this is some kind of stamp on my value. In Yeah, Matthew actually here gives amazing advice. That's right. Men, especially early on in interactions, give far too much care to how it goes. It's true. And and the reason why they give far too much care is because 95% of men get zero. They don't just get a little bit. They get zero. No attention, no validation, no positive response from girls. They get nothing. This is true in 2023. So, of course, because of that, Many men are very likely to freak out when things don't go well because they have no options. So when the one option they've had in the past three years uh, rejects them after the first, you know, 30 minutes of meeting the girl, they, they're they like, there must be something wrong with me. And truth be told, in 2023, in these girls' opinion, there is, even though they're wrong. Even though they're only choosing Chad, even though they'll be miserable in the future, those girls, they still see those men as invisible and unworthy. And that's why. Dating. And so we get nervous. If you can actually dilute that idea, like we just said, of how great this person is, because you don't know not, them. They're not, they don't deserve to be put on this crazy pedestal. That's right. And they don't deserve it because, well, there's actually multiple reasons why they don't deserve it. One of the reasons is this. If a girl has replied to you on a dating app or just in general, it means she sees you as at least at the at the absolute worst, she sees you as top 20%. Which means you're better than her. And in her eyes, you're better than most men. So because of that, she is actually lucky to be with you. And more than this, if she rejects you early on in the interaction without actually getting to know you, she doesn't actually know who she's missed because she never got to know you. So she doesn't even know who she rejected. She doesn't know you. She knows the 30 minutes of interaction with you, you, which doesn't represent you at all because it's such a tiny slice of the pie that makes you you. It can't possibly be a good representation. All right, shilling time. Uh, hit the like, hit the subscribe. Go to my Patreon and subscribe, patreon.com slash the Helios blog. Uh, get, uh, drop me a donation like Hunter M, Adrian R, or Tom M. You just have to click more under the video. That's the description box. And the links are there. So there's a link there for donation. There's a link there for buying my books. And um, yeah, that's, that's all I had to say about the shilling. Thank you. Let's continue. And at the same time, realize that if this person doesn't want what you have to offer, that isn't a sign of your value that doesn't have to have some great meaning about what your value or what your potential is in life before you carry on with the video no we're going to skip the advertisement sorry okay and else for whom you will be right so you don't need to have this feeling of panic of if this person doesn't like me it means something greater no it's if this if this person doesn't like you that's not your person or if this person yeah, that's not that's not a bad attitude. Uh, the the principle is called abundance mentality, right? The principle is this: if this girl didn't work, there will be a girl who will. 
and I'm and, and that's and that's fine and great. It's totally okay for this specific girl to not work out because I will have other opportunities. And there's another thing too, um, men, that's actually super good. As long as you take care of yourself, you keep working out, you you work on yourself, you improve yourself in multiple ways. Um, your lifespan for dating is huge. You can still get a girlfriend, have bedroom fun, have a very enjoyable life and time at 55 years old. If a girl is single at 55, not married, no children, her prospects are not like a 55-year-old man. They're much, much, much worse. So keep that in mind as well. You have time to recover. She doesn't. Person only likes you because, because you gave like a perfect 10 landing that's right. The, the perfect date, the perfect line. That's right. Whatever, that's the, right. The perfect first two weeks. Is that really the person you want to be with? Right. Like that. That's the, a good you point. always say the right relationship isn't brittle, but it's kind of like the right first couple of weeks isn't really brittle either. <laughs> yeah. That's absolutely true. That, that's right. If she expects you to be absolutely perfect and never make a single mistake in the first two weeks, she's too picky. And if she's too picky, that's gonna it's bound to come out in other ways later on. That is actually wise advice. That's actually that's actually true. Not terribly brittle. And by the way, if you're on a date and you're nervous, understand that that's not uncommon. Indeed, that people who have zero nerves have off. You know, that's not that's not often a desirable position to be in. To have that's not true actually uh the men that have zero nerves are the most attractive to women by far again if a guy has no nerves during a date what does it mean it means he's experienced it means he's charismatic it means he's good it means other women have chosen him it's a sign of social proof if you're not nervous on the date how many dates has this guy been on how many girls have have been on dates with this guy oh other girls must like him it's implied in your behavior right so no no women definitely find men with no nerves most attractive now if a girl is nervous when she's with you that's actually a fantastic sign as well it means she's not very experienced in dating which is actually very good uh so yeah if you're still nervous while you're dating it means you need more experience you need you need to just go through more iterations until you're not nervous anymore it's, it's okay because experience is is the best teacher right have zero nerves uh, sometimes having zero nerves is a reflection of a kind of detachment a uh, numbness so i don't know that the aspiration is to have absolutely no you know call them nerves call it just as excitement you can kind of choose different words for it at that level but the person who's not in any way connected to that feeling is is to some extent someone who's not really living uh, false. That's a feminine framed uh, sentence, right? Like, what? what's Matthew saying? If you don't experience emotions, if you don't lean into your emotions, you're not l really living. Uh, what? Like, no. <laughs> like, and here's what's funny. What's funny is that girls find the detached guys most attractive. They chase those detached guys and try to convince them to attach to them. So no, that's absolutely wrong. That is, that's wrong. And women find those guys the most attractive. Why is he not attached? He's not attached because he doesn't care. But why doesn't he care? Well, he doesn't care because he must have had so many girls that at this point he doesn't care. But if he's had so many girls, well, why, why has he had so many girls? There must be something about him that makes him attractive to so many girls. Let me see what he's about. You see? That's huge, guys. It's true. I find with any emotion of nerves or anxiety in life, you know, you're going to do a public talk, you're going to do a big pitch, you're about to go and pitch your book at an important agency or something, and oh my God, I hope they're going to like it. My reframe often is just curiosity, is just looking at it and going, this is a fun situation what what an interesting situation i'm in like i'm going to pitch to this person and they're going to say yes or no what an interesting life experience this is or i'm going to give this speech on stage what an interesting feeling this is that i'm going to have or an interesting experience and i kind of really like that i've never thought about it that way that's that's actually that's a wise thing to say 
It's a wise reframe. It's rather than I'm scared of the outcome, it's whether positive or negative, it's still a great experience. And, and here, here is my thinking again. Um, when I'm going on dates, right? Um, my attitude is, is this. In the future, I'm going to forget this even happened if it goes negative because so many things happen, you just forget, right? I'll only ever remember the good times. So if it's good, I'll remember that it went well. And if it doesn't go well, I'll literally forget. So that's fine. And like, think about it in the long term. This is just one girl in many in a long line of girls that I've talked to. If it goes well or badly, it doesn't matter. I understand what I'm capable of. I understand what I can do. I understand who I am, right? And if she doesn't like who I am, okay, she's allowed. She's allowed to say no. If she doesn't like me, cool. There will be a girl that does. What's wrong with that? You can do that with a person as well. If, just, if you target to... I'm going to learn something about them. I'm going to learn something about myself. I'm going to practice something that makes me a little uncomfortable. If you can go to a curious place in those moments, you actually relax a bit more because it's more about just, I'm going to see how this feels to stand on stage and talk about something to an audience. And that's all it is. Then you're in a different mindset than, oh my God, please like me. Please let this go. Well. Right, right, right. That's Very true. Good. I have another one which sounds similar, but I actually would like you guys to approach this one from a practical standpoint. So um, somebody wrote in and said that their biggest fear was not making a good first impression and that she always feels inadequate. From a how to put your best foot forward in the first few dates and early dating, can you give us some practical thoughts on how to do that? Why? I actually think that the fear of having not made a good first impression or of saying the wrong thing, it's, it's so intensely human. So, you know, there are people who we would all look up to and say, oh my God, they're so wise, they're so established, they have so much status, and yet they can still be in a room and say something and leave and go, that was really dumb. Why did I say that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, the beauty is this. So long as you don't die, you get another chance. So you can learn and do better next time. So even if you get utterly rejected and things don't go well, well, you did learn a lesson. And I mean, you know what they say. Um, what they say is that uh, rejection is the best teacher. Loss is the best teacher. So ultimately... If you win, you get a good result. And if you lose, you also get a good result. You learn something. So you don't really you don't really lose either way, even when you do lose. I mean, in the long term, anyway. That's We're all capable of doing that at any point. To me, what separates people is there are people who ruminate obsessively over that thing that they said. And there are people who are proactive about looking at it and going, okay, what would I like to say differently next time? Or why, why am I not, why do I not love that I said that? Yeah, again, if you're ruminating obsessively negatively about things, that's one of the ways to give yourself learned helplessness or to cause yourself the, the D word. So don't do that, okay? It's okay. You're allowed to make mistakes. You're a human. Okay? It's, it's not a problem. The problem is not getting up after getting knocked down. And life will do its best to try to knock you down as many times as possible, right? Because, you know, Schopenhauer, life swings like a pendulum backward and forward between pain and boredom. So life is determined to give you pain over and over. And it's up to you to just take it, ultimately. I mean, that's... People have gone through much harder, much worse things than getting rejected by a girl or talking in front of an audience, guys, historically speaking. So, you're okay. All right. Um, let's go to a chapter in uh, the book called The Rational Mail by Rudo Tomasi. This one is The Evolution of Game. If you ever need a reminder as to how, uh, how you came to a particular set of beliefs, the best way to consider that process is to write a book about it. 
The book you now hold in your hands is the compilation of the past 12 years of my involvement in the so-called Manosphere. It wasn't ev even known as the Manosphere back then. For the men who've read my ideas since the inception of the SOSWAP forum almost 12 years ago, I expect they'll find this section kind of remedial, like going back over old classics they'd internalized and taken for granted now. If I make a reference to hypergamy or the feminine imperative for most, there's a standard level of pre-understanding about the elements associated with each of these and many other concepts. However, a problem of familiarity arises when I or anyone else familiar with the RP awareness makes an attempt to educate the unfamiliar. The RP community makes a good effort of this, but after going through two revisions of this book, it became evident to myself and my editor that familiarizing the uninitiated is a major obstacle to reaching the men who will benefit the most from unplugging. So familiarity is number one. The majority of the requests I've received over the years for a comprehensive book of rational ideology has come from readers expressing the desire for a condensed version in book form which they can give to family and friends, mostly male, in the hopes they'll better understand their need for emancipation from their feminized uh, mental models. Of course, that's always been my goal from day one, but it presumes that a large part of those reading will be unfamiliar with common terms and concepts I or familiar readers will already have a grasp of. Another issue I often run into is the presumption that readers new to my blog or commenters on other blogs have a familiarity with my work. I often find myself having to link back to articles where I covered a specific topic that a critic or an inquisitive reader might want to take me to task about. For the most part, I make a conscious effort not to repeat something I've addressed, sometimes years before, that's simply a part of the medium of blogging. It's a difficult enough proposal to unplug men from their BP conditioning, but leading them to an understanding of principles they mentally have resistance or aversion to is a particular challenge. For example, my editor is only peripherally familiar with these principles, which is kind of a blessing and a curse. In one sense, it requires me to revise old posts and concepts to be more noob-friendly, but also challenges me to review how these concepts have evolved over the years to be what I and other RP people now consider common foundations. For instance, while I might rigorously debate the concept of the feminine imperative with those familiar with it on Dalrock's blog, I had to spend over an hour defining it further with my editor after he'd read my seminal post about it. More on this later. Game. Of these concepts, the one I return to the most frequent, uh, frequently is that of game. Just what is game? Throughout my blog and virtually every major Manosphere writer's blog, there's a constant presumption that readers will know exactly what game is when it's referred to. Game has been lifted up to an almost mythical state, like some cure-all for the common guy struggling with attracting women's attentions and intimacy. It's gotten to the point where familiarity with game has become a flippant aside for Manosphere bloggers. We have varieties of game. We have internalized game, we have natural game, direct game, beta game, etc. But defining the term game for someone unfamiliar with the very involved intricacies, behaviors, and the underlying psychological principles on which game is founded is really tough for the uninitiated to wrap their heads around in the beginning. For the unfamiliar, just the word game seems to infer deception or manipulation. You're not being real if you're playing a game, so from the outset we're starting off from a disadvantage of perception. This is further compounded when attempting to explain game concepts to a guy who's only ever been conditioned to just be himself with women and how women allegedly hate guys who play games with them. As bad as it sounds, it's really in the explanation of how game is more than the common perception that prompts a discussion for the new reader to have it explained. At its root level, game is a series of behavioral modifications to life skills based on psychological and sociological principles to facilitate inter-bedroom fun relations between genders early game. In its humble beginnings, game was a set of behaviors learned, adapted, and modified with the express purpose of bettering a guy's prospective bedroom fund success with the women he'd only limited access to. Game was defined as a series of behavioral skills and techniques ob observation experimented with and developed by the burgeoning PUA culture of the early 2000s. While there was a peripheral acknowledgement given to the psychology that made these behavior sets effective, the purpose was more about the result and less about the head mechanics that made the result possible. This introduction was many, uh, was many of the current Manosphere's first contact with formalized game. The quality of the art in pickup artistry was really left up to the pra practitioner's capacity to understand the basics of behavioral psychology and refining a deft ability to adapt and react to his target's changing behavioral cues in a given environment and or context. If this were the only extent of game, it would be understandably short-sighted and limited in scope. In the beginning, game had a utility in that it helped a majority of men lacking the social intelligence to approach and develop a real intimate rapport with women they fundamentally lacked. The problem was that beyond game's infield uses, it wasn't really developed past the point of getting the girl, and left even the most socially adept PUAs unprepared to deal with the real psycho psychology motivating women on a greater whole. 
It was just this feminine meta-psychology that drove men unaccustomed to enjoying and then losing the affections of women formerly out of their league to, bad, to do bad things to themselves. The game was a wondrous tool set of skills, but without the insight and foresight to deal with what these tools could build, it was potentially like giving children dynamite. Evolving game. From the earliest inception, game was more or less viewed as a solution to a problem. Game has been described as a logical social reaction to the women that the past 60 plus years of womanism, social feminization, and feminine primacy has created for the men of today. Courtesy of modern connectivity, the internet, and collectivized social media, evolving game or some variation of it was inevitable for men. Despite the public social stigma, ridicule, and outright hostility attached to men attempting to understand the psychologies of women, Privately, the internet facilitated a global consortium of men comparing experiences, relating observations, and testing theories. The behavioral psychology that led to game, which prompted the desired reactions in women, began to take on more importance for men. Sure, the now classic game techniques like cocky and funny, amuse mastery, agree and amplify, neg hits, peacocking were effective in their own awfully used context, but the latent psychology that made these behavior sets work prompted the question of why they worked. The psychological aspects of effective and ineffective game began to take on a new importance. Through this broader exploration of the role biological, psychological, and sociological factors affected game, sprang new ideas, theories, and experimentation uh, leading to a new game. As connectivity grew, so did the knowledge base of the game community. No longer was game exclusive to the PUA pioneers. Game was expanding to accommodate the interests and influences of men who'd never heard of the earlier version of game, or would have rejected it outright just years before due to the feminine conditioning. Married men wondered if aspects of game could reignite the bedroom fun interests of their frigid or overbearing wives. Divorced men embraced the game they ridiculed when married to improve their potential for new bedroom fun interests, but also to relate their experiences and contribute to that game knowledge base. Men, not just in Western culture, but from a globalized interest, began to awaken with each new contribution, not only to how women were, but why women were. Game was making the unknowable woman noble. The enigmatic feminine mystique began unraveling with each new contribution to the game knowledge base. Game was becoming something more. Men were now seeing the code in the matrix. We knew the medium was the message. We began to see the feminine social conventions used to control us. We began to see the overarching reach of the feminine imperative and femcentricism. And we came to realize the insidious but naturalistic influence feminine hypergamy had wrought in both men and women. Game was prompting men to push back the iron veil of feminine primacy and see what made a woman tick. Predictably, femcentric society sought to cast the rise and expansion of game as a modern version of the ridiculous macho archetypes of the 50s to 70s. The threat of an evolving, more intellectually valid form of game had to be ridiculed and shamed like anything else masculine. So the association with its infamous, infamous PUA forerunners was the obvious choice. The feminine standard appeal to masculinity catch-22 was the first recourse. Any man who desired to learn game was less of a man for that desire but also less of a man for not already knowing game. Any guy actually paying for or personally invested in game was associated with the PUA culture that was characterized as a throwback to the leisure suit Larry's of the 70s. For all its marginalization efforts to shame game back into obscurity, the feminine imperative found that the game movement wasn't being cowed as easily as it might have been in the mid-1990s. The imperative was falling back on the reliable tropes and social conventions that had always pushed the masculine back into compliance. At the apex of femcentricism in the 90s, these social constructs worked well on an isolated, shamed, and ignorant masculine imperative. With the evolution of the internet, by the late 2000s, game was snowballing into a threat that required new feminine operative conditions to contain it. And so on. All right. Back to the video here. And then going, you know, I, I remember I told a story recently. And I, I, afterwards, I just went, I don't like that story anymore. I remember thinking it. I told it like a hundred times. But but afterwards, I just... What was the story? <laughs> not, Tell it one more time. It. No. <laughs> it's done. But, the, but that was the point. I, I remember I told that story and I was like... I don't like that story anymore. I don't actually, it, it doesn't resonate with me. I, I think it's kind of stupid. I, I don't like it uh, the way I come across. I, and I just retired it. There you go. And you can retire your bad, your, your self-destructive thoughts and the ideas and opinions that led you to be unsuccessful in your life and with women. You can retire those. You can. You can change. And for some men, maybe you should. 
for your own benefit and the benefit of those around you, for future you. Okay, uh, on to relationship advice. This was posted eight hours ago. Uh, so the girl is 27, the boyfriend is 28. He wants a paternity test. Hey everyone, I'm 27 and he's 28. He said that he wants a paternity test when he has kids because he's afraid a kid would not be his. And he wastes his prime years by raising a kid that's not his own. I take it as an offense to me and my loyalty. Why would I go through nine months of hell with body changes for a random man and pass the kid off as my boyfriend? I told him this and his attitude is that because I feel so strongly against the test, it's a sign that he needs to do it. He's told me that every other woman he's been with has not had an issue with his intent to take the test. He's saying he's paranoid because he's seen stories of men raising kids that aren't their own. I'm here for advice because he claims all his friends agree with him, but everyone I've talked to has said the exact opposite. Because why would you marry someone you can't even trust to be faithful? How should he have reacted when he told me this? Yeah, so you see she wants to maintain the plausible deniability. That's what it is. Even though he wants what he wants, right? Top comment, 500. The two of you have totally different views on a very important topic. One of which, there is no middle ground. If you want to agree to a paternity test and he insists, please do not have kids together. Uh, okay. Uh, the idea of paternity testing by default is something that's very popular in certain corners of the internet. Have you noticed any other opinions he has about women or masculinity that you are uncomfortable with? I'd be worried that his request may be a canary in the coal mine. Uh, 144 upvotes. He goes on 4chan a lot and says that he only goes on to read the poll channel or to look at memes. He doesn't see that, uh, that cursing at me while he's angry is a problem because I started the fight and I pushed him too far. So what do you expect? Don't fight with me. A few of his friends have expressed concern that he doesn't treat women well and have told him to stop calling me a B-word, which he has stopped doing. Okay. Yeah. So, enough said. She wants more power in the relationship. She doesn't want him to have any. Okay, let's end the video there. Hit the sub, hit all for notifications, go to my Patreon and subscribe, patreon.com slash the Helios blog. Drop me a donation like Hunter M, Adrian R, Tom M. Uh, just click the more under the video and the links are there. Uh, buy my books at bit.ly slash Helios books. Again, you can find the link. Just click on more under the video and then it'll be there. Thank you so much for listening, guys, especially if you listen to the end. I really do appreciate it. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time.